And, and then uh, we'll have a focus on the evaluation of uncertainties and uh, you will get uh, a practical exercise uh, to be done with uh, an Excel file that you probably received already by, by email or you are going to receive it uh, later in, uh, this morning. Uh, and then we'll uh, also address uh, the modeling side uh, of this. You heard about uh, modeling at, in different presentations, but we'll have uh, Augustin Collette from INERIS who will uh, present more detail on the modeling side of, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, type of exercise. Okay, so Francesco, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, as a continuation of our discussion on health impact assessment, today we will address one of the central issues on how to make the impact assessment, which is the uh, assessment of the dose-response relationship between the specific exposure and the specific outcome. And as an, an outline, in my presentation today, we will see different aspects, what's a dose response, uh, compare the definition of dose response versus some toxicological uh, terminology, uh, which specific exposure response function we want to quantify, how I do get these functions. Uh, a response to a question that came yesterday, how I compare uh, the local estimates versus the uh, systematic review, the issue of double counting and the issue of the shape of the exposure response, and especially uh, the, 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 the issue of, uh, of addressing the high level of exposure, how we can extrapolate our those response when the exposure is high. Um, so, in terms of terminology, we, uh, he, you have here one nice link to the EPA um, uh, documents where you can find more of this terminology, of course, of the dose response assessment. Uh, but I want to just to introduce you some of the toxicological terms which are very useful to understand what we are speaking about. Um, so in, in toxicology and in risk assessment, we have some uh, interesting uh, concept. One is the no observed ad adverse effect level. So th this is the highest exposure level at which there is no biological increase in the frequency and severity of the effects. Okay, so until that level, we are pretty sure that there are no uh, health effects. Uh, and this is the term NOIL, which has been very much used from EPA and other agencies, including the uh, European agencies. On the other hand, uh, this is another term which is also interesting, is the lowest exposure well, uh, level at which there is a biological significant increase in frequency and severity. So you may, you may ask yourself, the, uh, why, uh, why we have two terms? This is the lowest observed level, and the other one is the no observed um, adverse effect level. So you could assume that in theory, they should be the same, right? Because you, are, you think, until a certain level, there, are, there is no biological effect, and then after that level, the, the, the increase in risk will start. But this is not the case because the evidence sometimes is not so clear. So, for instance, we are pretty sure that until that level there is no adverse health effects, but there is, but there is a gap of knowledge. And we know that just after a specific level there is an increase in health effects. So that's why we have two terms. The, the other terms that the toxicology have been using a lot is the so-called benchmark dose. Is a dose at concentration that produce a, a defined change in response for an adverse effect called the benchmark response. This is quite difficult if you, we read, but if, you go, if we go to this slide, it's very clear. So suppose we define this, uh, 
So we said, what's the benchmark dose and the men benchmark response? So we define that the benchmark uh, uh, response is 5%. So we are uh, interested in 5% in increase in risk. And the benchmark dose is, is the level of dose at which the 5% increase is observed. You see here. And so this benchmark dose comes with a confidence interval. So you, you are pretty sure that at this specific level, you have a 5% increase in risk of uh, the, the adverse effect over the ba baseline. This is the baseline, and this is where the 5% increase is reached. So th this um, uh, concept are, are quite used in toxicology, but let's go t back to um, epidemiology. And, and epidemiology uh, try to use more or less the same concept but the evidence is not coming from animal studies. The, animal, the evidence is coming from human studies. And coming from human studies and coming not from uh, experiments, but from observations, uh, the uncertainty is, is, of course, much higher. And especially in, uh, in, uh, in air pollution uh, epidemiology, uh, the, the exposure response uh, function comes from large court studies for the long-term effects or, or, or comes from time series for the short-term effects. So, so the, what is the exposure response function? And we, I call here exposure response function, but we'll see what's the meaning. It's the slope of a regression line where the health is the dependent variable and the exposure is the uh, independent variable. Uh, they come from both from epidemiology and toxicology, and they come with confidence intervals. And if you want, <coughs> if you want to see an example of this exposure response function coming from an epidemiological study, this is our uh, 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 core study. It's called this, the longitudinal study of Rome. This is a, core, a large court study that we developed in, in 2001. So it's a census court of more than one million people in, in, in Rome. They were enrolled in 2001 according to the census. And, and they have been following up in this study. They've been following up until 2010. We have now the follow up, uh, I think, for, uh, up to 2014 or something. And this publication, uh, we were providing the exposure response function for uh, NO2 and natural mortality. Natural mortality is total mortalities minus the accidents and, and, and uh, all the violent death. So this is natural mortality. It's basically old cause mortality. And as you see, there is uh, an increase. This is the slope of the regression line. There is an increase in risk of mortality uh, with increasing level of NO2 in this particular uh, particular um, uh, court um, investigation. Uh, I was saying I, I've been we have been using the term exposure response function, but we should be clear what what we are meaning. Usually in epidemiology, we we have the specific emission of, pollu of pollutants. These emissions cause increase in concentration, but as you know, one thing is concentration, and the other thing is the exposure, because the exposure very much depends on the time activity pattern of, of the specific person. So we have concentration, exposure, and of course from the exposure you have the internal dose, the biological effective dose, and biological effects. So, Many times we, we, can, we can speak of concentration, exposure, concentration response function, we can speak about exposure response function, and we can speak about dose response function. Of, of course, in, in many animal studies, we can, we can estimate the dose, uh, uh, but it's very difficult to estimate the dose in human studies. Uh, so we think we can estimate the exposure 
But even the exposure, we, you know that in many um, observational uh, court studies, you actually estimate uh, the uh, concentration out outdoor, the residential address of a specific person. So, and of course, the person is not sitting outside in front of the door all 24 hours. You know, he is sitting inside during the night and maybe he goes to work and he goes to, to school or other places. So, actually, we measure concentration, outdoor concentration at the residential address, but we don't measure exposure. So, the, the, the reason for this, so we, we say exposure response function, but we actually we are meaning concentration response function because it's the concentration estimated uh, outside. So this is due, of course, to the design of the epidemiological studies. And, and of course, people are making critiques regarding this. You say, how, how, how can you imagine that you uh, uh, make a surrogate of exposure just uh, estimating the concentration outside and, and giving to this specific subject that specific concentration for the, for the annual average? Of course, we know there is an this is an approximation. You know? What is interesting for us is the ranking. So if I get an exposure outside of 50 micrograms uh, PM 2.5, and someone uh, has an estimate of 30, we know that the gap is probably not 20. This is not the precise gap. There's a lot of uncertainty, but it's, it's pretty much sure that I, I get a much higher exposure than the other guy. So we know that it's a surrogate of exposure. Can we do better? Of course we could do better. So the, the theory, in theory, in the future, we should be able to, uh, to have more data on the time activity pattern of the individuals, including the time spent to commuting and including the time spent indoor at the office or the, 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 the plant or you know, the workplace. But this is something, is a future to come. Up to now, there is no single um, large epidemiological study that has been able to estimate real exposure, but just a proxy like uh, outdoor um, uh, concentration. Uh, the time activity pattern is, of course, very important. And uh, the time activity pattern is, is, is more complicated for the adult population because we you know we go to work. But if you are speaking about, if you are uh, interested in elderly, it, it, you are more sure that they spend more time indoor, uh, more time at, at home, so the misclassification is less. Uh, and maybe it, if we are speaking of children, uh, we know there is some misclassification, but they tend to live near, to, to spend their time near the home, you know, because they go to school near the home, because they, they play uh, near the home, so the misclassification is less. The most of the mis misclassification is the, uh, in the adult period of, of life. Um, so, we already spoke yesterday of the portability and transferability uh, issue. We already covered, and it's the issue of uh, uh, transferring the results of uh, different studies to a specific uh, other population and specific other uh, context. Um, so the, the question is, uh, what kind of exposure response function I want to, uh, to use? And, and, and of course, the first question is, what kind of outcome I want to uh, estimate? What kind of health effects? We were discussing yesterday of childhood leukemia, of course. If we think that the, 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 the first outcome of exposure uh, to volatile organic compounds is childhood leukemia, we need an exposure response function for childhood leukemia. Uh, we have to be uh, conscious that some uh, uh, exposure response function do exist and some other exposure response function, they do not exist because there are no enough uh, good studies. And, uh, 
And if there are not good studies in epidemiology, it's there that toxicology comes. So in a way, uh, there was a discussion yesterday of combining the toxicological and epidemiological evidence. Less evidence we have on, from human studies, more toxicology we have to use. Uh, but of course, there is uh, uh, the need to use more and more human studies and to do more, as was said yesterday, more epidemiological studies to have uh, more, uh, um, uh, more exposure response functions. Um, in choosing the exposure response function, we have to rely on the level of evidence. Uh, what, what is the level of evidence? Suppose we want to address the issue of air pollution and someone comes and says, okay, you are, you are saying that air pollution is able to cause an increase in, in mortality, is able to cause an increase in ischemic heart disease, uh, but uh, we know from two studies that it's also related to the cognitive function in children. Uh, and, and so the guy comes and says, you have to make an impact assessment, not only on mortality, not only on ischemic heart disease, but also on cognitive impairment in children. What would be your reaction? Knowing that you have plenty of studies on, on mortality, plenty of studies on, on, on ischemic heart disease, and two studies on cognitive function. What would you, would you do? Any suggestion? Okay. No suggestion. Yes. Uh, I could choose uh, extreme temperature, for example, or extreme heat or uh, extreme cold, and to see what's happened in the human body with the health, if they have some problem or sometime okay. morbidity, mortality. And yeah, but my question is, is, was the following. Uh, I have to estimate in a specific situation, suppose, you know, in a, a new uh, power plant. Uh, we have a discussion with the stakeholders, we have a discussion with the, the owner of the new power plant, and we have a discussion with the community group. And they both ask health impact assessment, okay? And you have a discussion with them, and they um, discuss your proposal. And your proposal is, okay, this is a new power plant. This is probably a coal power plant. So what kind of emissions this power plant has as, as particulate matter? So you come with your proposal. I can estimate, because I have enough uh, exposure response function, I can estimate uh, mortality coming from, from this new power plant, and I can estimate ischemic heart disease. And you have the community group saying, okay, you can estimate this, but we care about our children. You know, our children are more important than the elderly people. So we know from these two studies that uh, air pollution from this coal power plant will decrease the cognitive function of, of our children. So you have to estimate the effect of this new coal, coal power plant on cognitive function. Very aggressive, okay? So what you do? <laughs> I will write a list of caveats and I will perform the, the cognitive, disease, cognitive reduction impact assessment, but with the uncertainties, I mean, it's important to be clear about the, the caveat. Okay, I, I mean. okay. This is a good approach. So you say, I will rank my, my outcomes according to the level of the evidence. And with, I would say, we are pretty sure that for mortality and ischemic heart disease, we have very high level of evidence. But for cognitive function, this exposure response function I'm getting is from two studies, the level of evidence is much lower, so I will come with some caveats. 
in your uh, uh, proposal, we will do that, but with caveats. Some other people would say, I don't do this rubbish, okay? But this is something on, on the discussion. This is a good point. So, ranking, please. Yes, working. A uh, question from Samane, she's asking, can we check the cognitive capability of children uh, by comparing their ability at the beginning and after exposure? Okay, that's a good question. That's the indication that we need more clarification of health impact assessment and epidemiological study. Okay? A long term. So, so, I need a response from you to this question. Who wants to respond? Not Isabella. <laughs> so this question is, is just asking, can we do an epidemiological study and assess the cognitive ability of the children before the plant and after the plant? Of course we can do this. This is a nice epidemiological study. Why is nice? Because we have no exposure before and we have the exposure after. So it's the best of the comparison. But this is not the question we are asked for. So we have one there and one here. I, I was just wondering if it's really, we're talking about exposure and we're taking into account children and I was thinking about the ethical aspect of, uh, of the study. I don't know if uh, we're, we're giving a theoretical example, but when we talk about the exposure to air pollution and taking uh, epidemiological studies, or we cannot think about RCTs, let's say, or whatever uh, the design is. That's why uh, I have okay. this question. So this is more, more into the design of the study and the ethical aspects of study children, probably. But the question is, What's the value of the epidemiological study? What's the value of a health impact assessment? Please. Uh, sorry, I, I'm probably not going to answer your question exactly. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could, for a clarification, is this after the coal plant goes in? No, this is before. before. We, are, we are in a meeting, you know, in the whole of the municipality. You know, you have the industry people there, the community group, and you are the scientists. Right. So they are fighting all the time, and you have to decide what to do. This is before the plan. Yeah, because you can't do a health impact assessment on that community without, without, uh, without the coal plant going in. But you won't, can't answer the question. You can answer the question. That's so, the, so, so why we are here? Yeah. <laughs> we are here to respond to the questions before the plan. Right. Because we have to, to, to make these people agree. Yeah, so, I was going to say, you can't answer the question without studies from someplace else. Okay. Right. Okay. So, sure. okay. Sure. You can answer the question. If you have two studies suggesting that there's a relationship, you, you can come out with a sort of report, as, as, the, uh, as he was saying, uh, indicating that there, are, there is a solid evidence for some outcome. There is suggestive evidence for other outcomes. But what we are here is that we, are, we have a sort of moral uh, duty to, to respond to the question before the plan. You know, after the plan, everybody is able to do an epidemiological study. But we have to take the responsibility of responding to the request of people before the plan. And the health impact assessment is useful before, before the, the plan. Of course, because it's, it's prognostic in a way. We want to have a prognosis of the new implant. Of course, we, we, we have other health impact assessment which are not prognostic, are retrospective. You know, you can do an health impact assessment on what, what, what has been the effect of the, this existing plant in the last 20 years. So, please catch this, this terminology. It's retrospective health impact assessment and prognostic health impact assessment. So we are here especially for the prognostic one because we want to be useful for the decision of the policy makers and, and the stakeholders. Okay, so 
So we, we are addressing the severity of the L2 response. Oh, sorry, uh, you, want, you want to speak? Oh, yeah, sure, sorry. <laughs> just, yes, just the, the, for me, uh, okay, the, the a posteriori assessment, it depends also who is paying the research. Because if the, the company that is building the, the, the new power plant is saying, no, I need the health impact assessment now, and uh, the community is saying, no, we have to wait for, I mean, it, it could be something a, a little bit mm, not really easy to deal with. The other point is the, the, the population of children that can be uh, in, used for the uh, a posteriori epidemiological studies is the community, uh, let's say, is a rural area, then maybe we can uh, uh, use, use uh, uh, 500 children. Is, is, is that a, a, a strong epidemiological studies or, or is it just something that we can perform to, to let the community be more happy, but, but without the really strength of the study? Yeah, there, there are several issues, of course, to, to discuss, and especially if we decide to do an epidemiological study because the community wants. Usually, you do the health impact assessment, you do uh, your evaluation, but then, in any case, the community will ask for, uh, for an epi study after, after the, the, the plan. Uh, Francesco, I just got a question from internet from, uh, from uh, Hannah. Uh, sorry, maybe I should uh, come there. Uh, the question is, uh, why don't we compare children in another region with an already established plant with children in a place with no plant? If there is a difference, it will show a possible association. Yeah, this is again a question on the, on the type of the epidemiological study. So we can discuss, you know, one day on how to make an epi study uh, re regarding this. Um, uh, and of course, there are several possibilities on the comparison because most of the discussion on the EPI study is the comparison group. It's before, after with a comparison group usually, but this is not our our topic today. So our topic today is not the EPI study. It's more on on the health impact assessment. So. So we have been already speaking of the severity of health response because. I was concerned on, on mortality, and the community group is concerned on cognitive function. So we have to discuss which one is more severe. So to me, mortality is more severe, but for the people in the community, they care much more of children. So, so, uh, so the severity here goes with what I say here, the stakeholder view. So, so the, for the stakeholder view, it's much more important, children, um, children are much more important than elderly people. But of course, in the, in the assessment, a uh, number of people affected, it's, uh, it's also an important issue. Suppose that you are, you know, children, uh, you know, the community is, is very much uh, interested in, in cognitive function in children. And you discover that your area, your impacted area where the new plant will be uh, you know, this is basically elderly population. They don't have many children. There are a few villages with, uh, you know, just 50 or 60 children there. Uh, so, so the health impact assessment is not very powerful in that situation. So, so the size of the group affected is also a, a matter of, of discussion. So, okay. So we have this uh, 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 nice uh, 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 graph showing the, the severity, but it, you probably know it's well known. Um, so how I derive my exposure response function, what's the, the best recommendation? Use what other people have already used. And especially if you have a recommendation from uh, uh, authoritative organization like WHO, don't spend time. Use that specific recommendation because you are pretty sure you are not going into discussion because you are using WHO estimates. If you are using your estimates, you will get more 
problems and we, you would get more um, uh, questions. Or in some cases, you have to, be, especially when you don't have the WHO and an EPA or other organization uh, already uh, established exposure response function, then you want to do your systematic review and meta-analysis. And I think Carla will address this, that part of systematic review and meta-analysis in, in a more formal way. So you, have, you want to collect the evidence. And, and the last one, it's, it's very funny uh, methods, uh, but it it's, uh, has been used in, in, in the past. Uh, so where is the expert panel? Uh, so what is the expert panel? Uh, you don't have the evidence. You don't have the evidence from toxicological study. You don't have the evidence from the epidemiological study. But people ask to you, what is the effect? And what you can do, the only thing you can do is gather a group of experts and get uh, a guess estimates from the expert. Of course, in terms of uh, uh, answer, uh, you know, the level of confidence, I would go you know, first with, with this approach. Second, I would develop my systematic review or meta-analysis. And it's very rare that we should use this expert panel. But this has been going on for, for some exposure. For instance, there is a, in the literature on a, an exit panel on ultra-fine particles, you know, providing exposure response function uh, for ultra-fine particle as a guess estimates from the experts. So this is also interesting. Um, so uh, let, let's, let's I, I, want, I have a story here. So, for instance, we, we are discussing um, uh, uh, PM 2.5 and, and, and mortality. So how I get the exposure response function. Uh, so in 2013, uh, a systematic review was published from Gerald Hook. And this systematic review indicated that the relationship between PM 2.5 and, and, and mortal, natural mortality, the, uh, you see, this is, this is the result. It's called the forest plot. It's where we combine the results of the single studies. This, each one is a study. Uh, and the, the central point is the effect estimates. And then you have the confidence intervals here. So you have the numerical results here. So the first study is 1.06, 1.06. 126, they comes with confidence intervals. This is the weight of the study, and the weight is a function of the size of the study, of course, and, and this is the overall estimate. So this overall estimate is a weighted uh, uh, pooled estimates of all these numbers. So this systematic review came with uh, this magic number. 6% increase in, in mortality, uh, for each 10 micrograms in increase of PM 2.5. And this result uh, was also uh, taken from the uh, World Health Organization, which recommended in this report the exposure response function. So if you need the exposure response function, go to, uh, Google RAPIE, and you will get a lot of uh, uh, exposure response function for, for air pollution. So this is quite interesting. So in this report, let, let's look at all, all of this. This is the recommended uh, exposure response function. So it's 1.62, which is exactly the, the, the results of the, of the systematic review published in 2013. So we, we got a number from WHO. So, my point would be, if I have to estimate for the, for the new power plant, the new coal power plant, what would be the impact on, on the population after the, uh, the, 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 the operation of the plant, I can use this exposure response function. You know, but there are some guys coming from the community group saying, uh, okay, look, 
You know, this, this exposure response function is old. It was published in 2013, was using data until 2012. Uh, time passes, and in last, just last year, in 2017, uh, the, the large uh, court study on Medicare um, uh, patients in the United States, 60 million, 60 million uh, subjects was published, and uh, they had this nice exposure response function, and, and, the, and that function is a little bit higher than the 6% uh, percent from the systematic review. Why we should use this function, not the old function? So then, what you do, you, know, you have two possibilities. Use the old systematic review, 2013. You, you get this new, fresh um, result from the American study, uh, and you have to choose. But then you go, you go and see that after the systematic review in 2013, was not only the American study that was published, you had several studies published. And, and those studies were published just after the systematic review. So what I did in this case is made, uh, this way, uh, made a systematic review. So these were the old studies considered up to 2013. These are the new studies. And when I pulled them together uh, in the new systematic review and meta-analysis, my estimate is, is no longer 6%, it's 10%. So in, in my approach in this situation would be not to use the old one, but to use the new one. Please. For geography? Yes. Okay. These studies were, were basically uh, Europe and North America, or actually all are Europe and North America. Excuse me? Um, I feel this, I, I'm, I have confusion. Yeah, sure. So there you said that uh, the catch of value that you use uh, for a variate exposure was uh, maybe zero for PM25, zero, five micro, micro, microgram per uh, cube meter, or, or 10. And you choose that five uh, microgram per cubic meter is no, 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 we are using always 10, ten. always 10. So this, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, this, this is the old, is 6%, the one of all six is 6% per 10 micrograms uh, okay. PM 2.5. Uh, and this is also recommended by WHO. This is the function coming from, from the American study. These are the results, these are the new studies, and all these are for, um, for uh, sorry, these are the uh, increased risk, all are, all are for 10, because we, we made, uh, to make this systematic review, we have to have the same unit. And this is the, the new result, please. Sorry to bother you, but uh, what do you think about the fact that a particular matter in USA, Canada is different from particular matter in Europe in terms of composition? I mean... Uh, yeah, that's the problem of, of portability. You know, that's another issue. Also humidity. I yeah, mean, it's, it's a problem of portability. So we are now... Uh, you know, trying to find the best way to calculate this, uh, this exposure response. But of course, uh, you say, we are in Europe, we, we don't care about this funny Americans. So in, instead of uh, using, yeah. what? Without yeah, without diesel. So instead of doing, uh, an, uh, uh, transferring the information from US, we want to use only the European studies. So you, you can select from this the list only the European study and make a, a systematic review or an, an, a meta-analysis of the European studies only. Of course, when you publish that, you have the referee who is the American one and says, oh, you know, the, the European studies are 
shaky, so you have to use the American evidence. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you do both. <laughs> okay. So this is the way, please. Uh, I, okay. Uh, I had two questions, but one was about uh, these, about the American studies and European studies that, uh, but you, want, you already asked her. And the other one is just, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the names. Uh, one is, it was uh, in one paper, it was a relative risk, in another one is incident risk, uh, and here is no, increase, a, it's, uh, sorry, it's increased risk, risk. ER, it's, is, it's is the it same. same, it's the same. Okay. It's a, actually, the, the, the former concept, th these are all court studies, and for all court studies, they've been using the Cox proportional model. So, so from that study is the other ratio that comes from those studies. We call that relative risk in a, in a sort of, uh, you know, more familiar term. Okay, thank you. Oh, but, but the relative risk, if you want to transform the relative risk into an increase, percentage increase in risk, you just uh, um, take out the one so, and, and multiply by 100. So, so, for instance, in this case, 1.1 is 10% increased risk. Please. No, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about the portability of this data because I'm concerned about the pollution in Asia, especially in Indonesia. Uh, just like Isabella asks about the composition in PM 2.5 is different in each country. And in my country, even the PM 2.5 in several cities is low, but the heavy metal uh, content in the PM 2.5 is very high. What do you think about that? Thank yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, this, this is uh, one of the most important issues in, the, in this estimate of uh, the, the global impact of air pollution. One is the, the, the transfer uh, of information from one population to another population, and the other is the transfer of information from one, one kind of uh, exposure to another kind of exposure. So the assumption that we make here is that PM is toxic everywhere in the world the same way, uh, in, uh, you know, independently from the source. But you know, we, this is this very strong assumption. We know that the, this is not true, desert dust is probably different than anthropogenic uh, dust, and within the dust it's different whether the emissions come from a steel plant or they come from a diesel or that they come from a smelt, a smelter industry. So you are perfectly right. So in the future, in 30 years, we will need exposure response function source specific. You know, if we have source specific exposure response function, then we solve the transferability problem of the source, not of the population. We need uh, exposure response function that are population specific. Okay. But nevertheless, we go back to the example. We have to do the health impact assessment now, not in 30 years. So we have to respond. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, we, I have another, another example here, again, of transferability. And this is an example of, on not on long-term exposure, on, on the short-term effects. So for the short-term effects of particles, we had, in, in 2001, we had this wonderful study that was, was called the AFIA study, it was conducted in 29 European cities, it was published in epidemiology in 2001, and that one was providing the percent increase risk in mortality for short-term exposure to PM10 in this case. Uh, you know, as Italians, we are always proud to be up here. You know, this is, uh, you know, the ranking of, of the effects. Athens is the first with an effect size of 1.5%. Uh, uh, Lyon then, and, and then Rome, Milano, and Turin. Uh, with a fact size of about 1%, and then all the others are, are much lower. So I said, as Italians, we are very proud to have very toxic um, uh, uh, air pollution. Uh, but my question is, I have to make an health impact assessment 
in Rome, in Helsinki, and in Erfurt. What kind of uh, exposure response function I, I can choose? Uh, let's go here. So we have, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, so I read here is, uh, so the effect estimate is one point, uh, let's say 5% for Rome, it's 0 0.4 for Helsinki, and uh, minus 3% for effort, okay? And the total estimate is about one, is 0.50%, uh, 0 0.05. So which one I should use for Rome, Helsinki, and effort? I have this uh, option. We are in Rome, we use the Rome data set, use the uh, effect estimate from Rome. We are in effort, we want to be German, we want to use the local um, estimate, so the effect size is minus 0.3%. So what, or, so I choose the city specific, or I know that combining all the studies, the effect estimate is 0.5%, which is an average of all the studies. So what I should do, city specific or the pool estimates? Do we, do we have any indication here? Any idea? I go with the local or I go, if I go with the local, of course I should go with the local both in Rome and in effort because I cannot change my criteria. Because in Rome, I will get a positive uh, uh, number. In Erfurt, I will get a negative number. But on the other hand, I have the information from the pool estimates. So what do you think? Wh 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 which one is stronger? Is the pool estimates or the, the single city estimates? What do you think? In, 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 you, you have a lot of information here. You have a lot of information here, a lot of points. These points are specific for each city, but also you have an overall. What do you believe? The pool, one. the pool one. Why the pool one? Because the pool one is the synthesis of the evidence across the different populations. Okay? So even though in effort, I, I, I get this uh, negative result with these large confidence intervals, uh, I have this information from Erfurt, but I also have this pool estimate. So I have to make a sort of uh, compromise. Uh, the best choice would be to use the pool estimates. But you know, you have people here saying, okay, it's okay for the, with the pool estimates, but I have information from my city. So there is a tension there. And there is a nice solution uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, there is another, another possibility to try to understand why this, there is a difference. But the, the, the best solution it was invented, uh, try to estimate a weighted average between the local estimates and the pool estimates. So in a way, give some weight to your local estimate, but don't forget the pool estimate. And it's a method to do this. So now this is just to say that in this specific study, they uh, were able to evaluate the, the fact that these estimates were different, whether the NO2 level was low and high, you see there is big difference in the estimate, whether the temperature was low or was high, and, and the geography was, of course, very important. So this was a way to um, explain the heterogeneity. But this is the method. You know, it's very difficult in Bayesian uh, uh, approach, but in, in simple term, is is the weighted average of the local estimate and the pool estimates. Okay, it's very simple. You know, the the, the you know mathematicians and statisticians they make it difficult. So. To run that, you have to go to a statistician. But in terms of understanding, it's very, 
simple. It's a weighted average of the two. And, and you know, this is, this is a graph, you know, let's see for Rome. So for Rome here, I have five minutes, almost done. For Rome here, you know, that was the old estimate, you know, the original local estimate. And, the, and, the, and this one is the uh, reduced estimate. So you see it's much closer to the pooled estimate, but it's in between the pooled estimate and the local estimate, where, as you see, it's closer to the pooled estimate. So the pooled estimate is stronger than the local one. But in any case, you have, uh, uh, you have some elevation here. In the case of Erfurt, where is Erfurt is here, you see the local estimate is down here, and the, the uh, adjusted estimate is here. It's lower than, than the pooled estimate. So it, this estimate is very w well influenced by the local one, but it's not extreme as the local one. So this is a way to address the issue of uh, having a, a sort of compromise between the local and the, and the overall estimate. Do you have a question regarding this? This is what's... One for the moment, it's going to be quite uh, rapid. Uh, what is the meaning of negative increase in mortality? <laughs> it's a decrease, sorry. Yes, what I thought, <laughs> but okay. Thank you, Samuel, for your questions, what I thought, but... <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Francesco, just a quick question. I have the impression that the Error bars are more similar from one city to another in so this say plot. Again, sorry. The error bars, the uncertainties, they're not identical from each city on this plot, but they're much more similar compared to the plot you were showing before. So how the shrunken estimate affects the error bars? Is uh, they should increase the error bar. But first, they increase compared to the previous one, compared to the local pre okay. uh, error bars. Let's see. Let's see. I, d I don't have. I don't have the answer. So, for instance, le let's look. Let's look Rome here. So Rome goes from minus uh, from uh, let's say uh, eight per no, uh, zero eight to one point nine. Right. Let's go. And here goes from. Uh, uh, from um, one, it's it's much it's much smaller. It's much smaller, actually. It's much smaller. Yeah. So this method is also shrunken the the the, the confidence and interval. And it's it remains city specific. The yeah, it remain, it remains specific. Yeah. You know, the the reason why you know, this is a good po point. The reason why it reduced the confidence intervals is because it's using, it's using the pooled estimate. You know, the pooled estimate has a very narrow confidence interval. So it's used, since we are using that with very narrow confidence intervals, this will reduce also the local one. Okay. So, other questions? I have one, Francisco. So there is a kind of discussion to, to know what kind of uh, estimate you have to use, and you have to discussion with the people you, you work for. So uh, what is science, uh, what science must keep? Because finally discussion can go very far onto the, what kind of estimate we use, what kind of weighted estimate we use, what are the weights, what, so what, uh, where is uh, the science, uh, um, uh, hard, hard, uh, yeah, the hard science. Yeah, there is no hard science here. But it's a general principle, which I think is, is in, in inherent in the Bayesian approach. And I think the Bayesian approach is very similar to our way of thinking. You know, in our way of thinking, you have an a priori. Okay? So no one will, dis will convince you that your priority is wrong. No? But the only thing that will, will try to move you from your a priori is the evidence. But then when you have to make a judgment, you have your a priori, you have the evidence, and your next step is to make an average from your a priori 
an average with the evidence. So your a priori will be much closer to the, ev to the evidence, but you still keep the a priori in a way. And you are moving, you have more evidence, you have your a priori, which was modified from the previous a priori, and you, you, you move and you change your, your, your judgment. So you know, this is how our mind works. There's no problem, this is our mind. You know, if you don't agree, no problem, but this is what I think. That's the way we, 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 we go on. We change uh, our mind according to the evidence, but gradually, not suddenly. Okay, so the way we have to approach, this, this is uh, weighted average between the pool estimate and the local one, is in a way approaching our way of thinking. You know, our way of thinking is, we have some evidence there, we have a large evidence here, so I, th I think that the large evidence is correct, but I cannot um, uh, ignore the fact that there, they had the specific effect. So there's no, you know, there's open discussion, but I think the Bayesian approach is the right way to go. I agree, but it works if just only if your a priori is based on evidence. So it's a circle, and it's and the because the judgment should be evidence based yeah, against it's, sometimes the a priori. Yeah, but okay. if your a priori is evidence based, it comes from other. You know, it's maybe the it, the crucial is the definition of a priori. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, although, uh, you know, I think the a priori should come from the evidence, but it, it's, it's a collective evidence. It's not only the evidence from facts, it's also the evidence from, you know, other information that you have from biology, other information you have from toxicology. So the, the evidence that form your a priori is not only based on facts, it's on, also based on, on several aspects related to the mechanism. So it's, it's much more rich, in a way, than a single experiment. That's my, that's my, okay. So they say it's time for, to close. <laughs> thank you, thank you, it was a good pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here. <laughs>